This is Babbit Babbage, and this is uh, a recording made on the 2nd of July. That's a Friday. So this is really just a kind of intervention. And it's also to uh, remind all of us that on Monday, we really won't have anything due technically because that will be the day that should have been the July 4th. Uh, holiday, which takes place over the weekend. And so on the 6th, the reading analysis for Ivan Illich H2O and the Waters of Forgetfulness will be due. And because of that, we've been focusing on in the last two uh, assignments, Ivan Illich, looking at the cultivation of conspiracy and also uh, a little bit more familiar text. I think most people know or should know the schooling society. But Left over from June 30th is a very interesting discussion of breath. We had the video talking about Ivan Illich's cultivation of conspiracy, but we didn't look at Addington. Your breath is your worst enemy, which she, of course, borrowed from. I think I have it over here, a uh, an middle of the 19th century worry about exactly the same sort of things that are still concerns today. So with that, I'm going to share a screen, talk about that. This won't be a very, very long video, uh, and hopefully uh, will be helpful in the transition to uh, the next unit, unit four. Breath. The Addington text that I'm talking about is available on the library website. It's an ebook, Living with the Genie. A couple of the assignments are coming from that, so you'll probably want to locate that. We'll be looking ahead at Gregor Wolbring, uh, Confined to Your Legs, and uh, some other things, should be Svanathan, and so on. And Latour, the, 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 the section on air, we're going to be obliquely referring to that, but we'll probably pick that up when we get to Slaughter Dyke. All the recommended texts are recommended. And we said at the beginning of the term, you can read these at your leisure. And in many cases, you're gonna to want to put those off, maybe to the time you're writing your paper when you need to maybe draw on some secondary sources in case you want, because the sources for the paper, as long as it, one is mentioning this, for the class when we finally do our term paper are drawn from the text we've been talking about and recommending the entire term. That means that we're looking at just some of the leftover materials and the one in particular uh, that we're going to be looking at is the text. Uh, remember the one on, 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 on conspiracy. Now, if you took a look at that video, you will see something of the iconoclastic style of Ivan Illich. And you want to remember when you're thinking about reading the text that's assigned for Monday and Tuesday, that Illich was a historian by training and a priest by formation. Illich focuses on spirit, obviously, very much as a matter. And that's why this next, oh, I just said something, this next a video is related to that, a matter of incarnate breath, including sensed awareness. Whereas, if we can look ahead at herself, uh, Professor Michelle Addington, who taught in the School of Architecture at Yale University, also Harvard, also Munich, I, I, sh I should add, and, and who also worked for NASA. I'm gonna mention that again later because uh, as her press bios often emphasize, she's literally a rocket scientist. So that's kind of interesting uh, for us. But she's also right now at this moment, she's one of the first in, in, in a century, more than a century, a dean, female dean of the School of Architecture at Austin, at the University of Texas. Good. She raises, very importantly, some very different questions. And uh, these are questions that the current ongoing and one wants to say recent, but, but we still have variants, so we still have concerns. Pandemic has also brought to our attention in a very different way. Thus, she means her title, Your Breath is Your Worst Enemy, fairly literally. And of course, she's really talking about buildings and uh, factory installations, but also at Fordham itself, where you will have a kind of intake van. This is a kind of a smoky and casual version of the same. Her issue, the theme she's talking about is ventilation. You also see ventilation. I think it is here. 
I'm not sure where it is. Anyway, wherever it is, behind me, right there. Yes. Um, where you can look up ahead at Fordham and also in between. And actually, at Fordham, a very interesting thing. We at Fordham have access to this in a funny way because of the new bit, the new law school. We can see this sort of on the ground level. So those are roof or interfloor or ground floors in the case of Fordham. Ventilation ducts, as we can see. And sometimes one thing you don't see so much, but you see in the photograph, you might not see if you were actually there, there will be the dust for the worker. The same thing is, of course, also true uh, when you're walking across from Lowenstein to the Quinn Library. So you can see this here, they're often protected with sometimes really questionable materials, often fiberglass, sometimes changed out, sometimes not. So this is the HVAC, the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning sort of sort of guts or lungs of a building. And we have such a thing as this in every building in New York, including Fordham, both the older building at Lincoln Center, which is pretty much a text case of the sick building syndrome she's talking about, and the new building. And I was referring to that, if you've ever walked, this is actually one of the nicer images of this because the better image they don't have a photograph of on the website for some reason. From Lowenstein over to the cafeteria in the law school, the lower level entrance to Quinn Library, if you go from the corridor, the entry, all the way across. So you, you'd hear and you'd sometimes feel a positive air pressure that equalizes the HVAC between the two buildings. Not the most ideal thing in the world. So you could kind of guess that uh, Addington wasn't the architect and certainly not one of her students who designed the new law school building. Now, I said she was an actual rocket scientist and some blurb, uh, uh, several of them actually about her will emphasize this because she worked for her. NASA, one of the things you'll see, even if you weren't told that, is that she really pays attention to very, very fine details, systematically construed. So she has an engineering-minded architect's sensibility. Okay, now to take a look at her text, Professor Addington begins in a fashion that we've come to recognize, right? She starts by telling us that uh, here's we have our the beautiful. It's actually gorgeous, but who, who, what architect designed this would be a question of the details. The details that Addington sweats and that not not everyone does, but Elul does, right? As we saw, he pays attention to the systematic character of technology, and this we also saw in some of the other readings that we looked at the need, the necessity of amortizing any investment, deploying it as quickly as possible. So when you build a building, you also want to get quick quick use out of it, as well as maintaining it, even when the science has progressed. So she writes, this is her first line, technologies are rarely questioned. We assume they evolve and become obsolete as maturing scientific theories produce better technologies. But turns out, and that's what she's going to be talking about, some technologies persist, even when the science affords us better alternatives. And that today, 2021, is an in interesting observation from your breath is your worst enemy. Here, Addington argues a bit differently than some of the other authors we've been reading as an applied theorist. She goes on to remind us that other factors besides science, but she makes the same point yet. She makes the point differently, but it's the same point. Or what she also calls progress, science of progress, can determine the conditions, contours, the conditions, the actual makeup of our technological world. So I've added her very careful reflections on green architecture and sensibility in a video. I'm gonna put that up separately after this current video because she's very short, just a few minutes, it's made for press and she's pretty concise about that. But since we're talking about climate change a little later in the term, I thought, I thought it could be handy. And one point you might wanna take away from that if you're interested in green architecture, is that you need to pay attention to some of the complexity she emphasizes in the essay we're talking about right now, your breath is your, is, is your worst enemy, as it were, and how do you design a green building? How do you, how do you, how do you build green for the future? So the trouble is, 
as she underlines for us, in, in a way that I think is very familiar for, for us at, at, at Fordham and in New York City, is that one inherits a legacy, which is hardly the cutting edge, and yet a legacy that's installed, literally built for you at cutting edge prices, bringing a ventilation disaster. Bad enough with sick building syndrome, which is, was the concern for her. Her, her, her essay, as she writes it, is, is 2003. But a syndrome that has in the interim not only been uh, uh, resolved, but which also has other burdens post-COVID. Addington uses the same language then, in this case, it is the same as Elul and Adorno and Marcuse and Anders, because the trouble really starts when things become standard. The word is ubiquity, when they become ubiquitous. So she says, in the case of HVAC systems, the ubiquity as such carries a large penalty. This is Addington herself. Building systems are responsible for more than a third of this nation's energy use and their consumption is escalating at a faster rate than that of the other sectors. So she counts them off, industry, agriculture, and transportation. She goes on, but we're ending there. Now note that this is tied to CO2 levels. So she says already then, furthermore, in 2000, so for her that was three years earlier, the Department of Energy reported that energy use in buildings is responsible for 35% of the nation's carbon dioxide emissions. 48% of the sulfur dioxide emissions and 23% of the nitrogen emissions with emissions expected to increase by more than 25% between now, that would be 2003 and 2010. So you can imagine where it is now today, 2021. So that's her very warning reflection. So apart from asking where we are now, we might wonder because as you recognize this image, the technology in question hasn't changed with the heat wave, we're also very well aware of its, of its importance. It all begins, that's why I mentioned it twice, with the details of rocket science. And that is, as we know, if we recall the internal combustion engine, a matter of mixing and exploding certain bits of fuel and certain bits of atmosphere. To do this assumes a rather important issue, and that is that one knows what air is. As Addington puts it, that one knows, as she says, the constituents of air. What's air made of? And when you ask that question, that leads to worries about, and, and COVID today shows us just how very far it can go when it comes to what she says, concern about the human contamination of air through respiration, just breathing, and bodily processes, that too, but we're not up to that yet at the current time, but it's still an issue. She goes on, she explains, ranging from carbonic acid gas, we're gonna talk about that a little bit later, that's car carbon dioxide, to crowd poison, just being near other people, that's why you need social distancing, and body odor. Human bioeffluents were considered to be the source of deadly disease. And so in 1861, Lewis Leeds, that's the author of this book here, presented a series of lectures at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia titled, Your Own Breath is Your Worst Enemy. And he was really talking, you can see that on the book cover, ventilation. Have it here, where his man's own breath is his greatest enemy. Here, this is the 1861 book, John Wiley, uh, the original version, this is a later reprint in 60, 69, I think, but he originally presented in 61. 2021, again, we've just lived through the persistence, the durability of this very ubiquitous conviction. She says ventilation with outside air of any quality, which was what people then began to design for. She's writing from an architectural point of view, clearly a design point of view, means that even if the ventilated outside air comes from a highly polluted urban environment, think of New York, think of some other towns, was seen as the only way to prevent dullness, dementia, and perhaps death from human contaminated interior air, which you really wanted to clear out as much as possible. Early strategy simply suggested that windows be opened, that's all. But the solutions quickly became more complex and idiosyncratic. I wanted to finish that, that's the next slide, throughout uh, the 19th century. 
Of course, everything Addington is talking about is key to building design. That's that slide that keeps coming back because that's downtown, right? The 1916 zoning law uh, that was instituted in downtown Manhattan. Of course, they had all kinds of ideas about what they should be. I think the only place you could probably see that might be down uh, going on to the real intersection in the edge of Gramercy Park on 23rd Street. Uh, if you go there and you'll see some buildings that still have, you almost see this, that kind of structure. They were gonna build, they thought they were gonna build these wonderful elevated uh, subways. They, we, they have some versions of them, but nothing of course like that. They just decided you could go down and cross up and that would be the easiest way. And you could just have one rather than two. So these, are in effect almost anywhere you see these zoning rules etc in a london building design in new haven and so on and this sort of thing still characterizes the best of the pre-war buildings of course it all takes off she argues she reminds us with schools because mandates and that's also something that jacques Ellul underlined how do you get this done well you go to the schools those mandates can be applied in schools most easily and they have to be, you can get full compliance. Health turns out to be, as she then says, because she's taking still the, she's not looking at this politically, she's just looking at it from the point of view of an architect and a theorist of design, where what you need to do is save on fuel costs. School superintendents, she says, found it particularly burdensome during winter to operate mechanical ventilation systems because they drove up both heating and operating costs. So if you have to open the air vents, as it were, meaning if you had to open the windows, you were gonna have to spend more money on heating uh, to do it. So when you, you wanna close the windows, whole quite of questions with regard to ventilation, but it's cheaper, you're not letting the heat out. You may have heard that phrase from your parents growing up, don't let the heat out. So factory owners had similar concerns, of course, as the growing interest in working conditions was pushing them to adopt. And we can see how this happened most recently because you really have a big tension when trying to let air in and you're trying to keep it warm. So what you really wind up doing is, yeah, don't keep it warm. So as a result, as she says, both the public and private sectors were eager to embrace any challenge to the healthfulness of the HVAC system. So people were saying it was good, but at the same time, it was expensive. So if you could say it wasn't, there would be a special interest or a lot of interest in hearing that. That's on page 88. The tension she points to, she's really paying attention to all these different factors, was complicated by the flu. We know that, that's the same Spanish flu about which we've been hearing a great deal, the uh, great influenza uh, pandemic of the day not less at the same time, also complicated by different approaches. How should you air condition the air? What should you do? And to that, in addition, you have to add a certain anti-poverty prejudice. One isn't really on the side of the poor. One isn't on the side of the emigrants at the time, the Irish and the Italians and so on. And the desire to quarantine the hoi polloi, keep them away, put them in their own various ghettos, their own sections, keeping them away from the special summering and wintering grounds of the wealthy. So to a certain extent, you could say the pandemic is the first time in history that's ever been achieved for the well-off classes because, you know, you couldn't go to, to say, oh, this, this winter time, I'm really gonna have the, a blowout of a vacation, I'm gonna go to the Bahamas or the Caribbean over the winter because you weren't allowed to fly. So wealthy people who live there had the time of their lives. No pesky people, no intruding folk. They were all, all those lower class people locked away on lockdown. So the elite data symbol, this is Addington, page 90, of the earlier centuries outdoor alpine spa was supplanted by the 20th century's isolated, perfectly conditioned interior. That becomes the watchword of the previous century. It's still to this day a very important thing, as she points out, when it comes to buildings and also with the current heat wave across uh, the uh, upper Northwest and, of course, other portions, including New York in the United States at this moment. 
So the exact air, the language, this is very much what we're talking about. This is a drawing, very similar, not accident, no accident there with overlapping crosswalks, which is, you know, you, you imagine this was, this was how pedestrians used to think of it, that you would really have all this access for pedestrians. You don't. And the cars would go underneath. You don't. Instead, you save on money. And we saw that this the form follows function, but functionality really eliminates form. But that's Le, Le Corbusier, exact air. And Le Corbusier, because he's a, an architect, is thinking these kinds of buildings will work off one another and can be used with one another to contain and control the atmosphere completely. Because in a city, your air is different. Very important. The buildings face one another. There's space from one another in a particular way. So if you look at that secondary video that I recommend, very short, she's talking about heat sinks. She means that very much as a physicist might, but also the way an architectural theorist might, because these make all the difference in an, an urban environment. And Latour's essay on air is also related to this. We'll see that later. So this Le Corbusier who argues for this Addington sites from his 1930 house of exact breathing. One more time, more ubiquity, because that's the point. The point is ubiquity. The Russian house, the Parisian, at Suez or in Buenos Aires, the luxury liner crossing the equator will be hermetically sealed. In winter, it is warm inside, in summer cool, which means at all times there's clean air inside at exactly eight degrees. Okay, that means, of course, centigrade, Celsius. The house is sealed fast. So nothing gets in, nothing gets out. As we know, Le Corbusier invents this exact air. Ideal, he invents the connection, the coordination between closed windows and glass, glazing and air conditioning, which the Lowenstein building in, in, at Lincoln Center really gives us the short answer to the reason why. For decades since it was built, actually, none of the windows at Lowenstein ever opened. You couldn't open them. So as Professor Addington summarizes, and I hope some students are thinking of architecture school for their, for their futures, it might be a nice idea. Here we have more, this actual Le Corbusier eye in the sky. Uh, diagrams and illustrations of just how this will be done, how all of these places will be. Here's, you see the French, ciel, heaven. And obviously you have the inside and the outside, the same vision of architecture. So as the visual aesthetic of modernism began to supplant, as she says, uh, its ideological agenda, the socialist underpinnings of modern architecture progressively lost their context. And in yet another curious reversal, the sealed air conditioned building, the product of socialism became the symbol of capitalism and corporate America in the latter half of the 20th century. So oddly akin as she seems to be making her case to the argument that Heidegger makes when he suggests that it's not science that enables or makes technology modern as it is, Addington reflects that no amount of history on the matter will change our mind. Even if we are confronted with the social and ideological history of the ubiquitous HVAC system, many would argue readily that the idiosyncrasy of the influences coupled with the 200 year persistence of the technology supports the reading that the technology was a driving force, not the result of social and cultural beliefs about the human environment. So conventional wisdom asserts, this is her point, page 92, that technology is the physical solution of a problem and the evolution of technology simply optimizes the solution. This is this, what could be more basic. If the problem is the heating and cooling of buildings, what better solution could there be than heating and cooling the buildings, namely an HVAC system, particularly because the thermal conditions of buildings that should get our attention are difficult to control. Wait a minute, are they? Why so? Good question, page 92. So in the next few pages, as she continues her rocket science background tends to come to the fore, she goes on to say, no, 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 unlike most other problems in fluid mechanics, because we could think it should be easy to heat a building. Turns out, add all issues of fluid mechanics and heat transfer, 
building air behavior, which is the way she talks about it, is a true mixing bowl of phenomena, wide ranging velocities, temperature density, stratification. You can kind of see that in this uh, infrared uh, depiction of, of a building, conductive, convective and radiant transfer, laminar and turbulent flows and randomly moving and, and, and randomly heat generating objects, all of that together. To this extent, that this will be the equivalent of, of the point Heidegger makes in the question concerning technology. If one substitutes equipment or systems for technology, she can say, when we consider technology to be equipment, think of Zeug for Heidegger, or systems, same thing, then our efforts to improve technology tend to stay with the cycle of evolution and obsolescence. Faster computer processes, this is a standard argument, replace slower ones, hybrid engines, for automobiles improve on gasoline engines. One presumes there's an identified need and an identified technological solution such that the uh, focus is simply on improvement. This will be what a lot of people are arguing. Uh, we're going to have a, an extra link to a, a video a little later in the term to Professor Vincent Block of uh, Wageningen, where Block argues very, very simply that, you know, really the question is how do you drive innovation? How do you pay attention to innovation? And of course, Steve Fuller, uh, up, 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 at, up at Warwick is actually saying, well, no, most of the time it's a mistake where you get something new. It's, you, you discover it by serendipity, which means by accident, by error. And then the question is, how do you sort of systematize uh, that if you, if, if you want to come up with some new ideas? So there are additional factors. One thing that might surprise us, should shock us, is her attention to misanthropy or anthrophobia, being afraid of other people, which we've certainly seen for the last more than a year and a half. Heating the air surrounding the body, she's really writing about central heating as a concept, was an exorbitantly expensive and noxious proposition because high quality and clean fuels were available only to the very wealthy. The development of ventilation during the 19th century was posed as a solution, not to heating or cooling the body, but as a solution to a growing anthrophobia. Very important. Ventilation aimed at diluting the air around the human body, not to maintain the air in a building at particular conditions. So it's really to, to making sure that you weren't subject to the miasmas from other people. It wasn't really about heat per se. It was really for the sake of making sure that everyone's other, everyone's breath wasn't on you and things could be ventilated or cleared off in the appropriate way. So she mentions miasma very, very much in the very beginning, because of course, that's the primary concern, because miasma was believed to be a source of disease, and of course, in general, not feeling well. So here you can see a ventilation diagram, uh, which is obviously concerned with the same thing. There's your latrine, because you're going to need to have options to uh, get rid of the waste that are produced by the inhabitants in this house, two different rooms, uh, air is circulated in various ways, the latrine itself is going to be filtered perhaps, perhaps there's water underneath, it doesn't matter, but your whole question is how to get the air that's circulating such that the air circulates in the right way and doesn't, there's our second vent, we still have this, you can still see this with regard to kitchens, but also with regard to bathrooms in downtown structures, but also uh, anywhere, anywhere, anywhere pretty much around New York. In general, you're going to want to have, uh, sometimes you'll have, if you don't have a window in a bathroom, you're going to need to have a fan and the fan goes to a vent and the vent is got to go outside, not just into the house. So when we get to H2O and the waters of forgetfulness, we're talking about pretty much the same thing when we read this, how we can forget those waters in a water closet, which would be the parallel that he'd be making. For Addington, only when germ theory and a societal obsession with hygiene, we've, we have, we've seen that, that, that 
societal obsession still exists, and purity gave rise to the ideal of the sealed building. Did the requirement for homogenous interior conditions become paramount in importance? That's 93. She goes on in the next pages to talk about thermodynamics. That's physics. That's heat. We were just talking about that. HVAC systems from page 94 are excellent for heating or cooling air, but heating or cooling air is the most inefficient means of heating or cooling the body. There were lots of other techniques that were used over history, and they were all more efficient. So if we summarize, as she says, and she talk discussion of heat sinks and thermal load, after the fate, as she says, of the open window was sealed, HVAC systems became ubiquitous and the components were hidden deep in the infrastructure, invisible except, as she writes, to the building engineer. Now, the only way to see the concerns Addington raises is historically. And it's not the case that all the problems have been solved in the interim, but a few things can be seen where she writes, she goes on to say, here is our sick building syndrome. During the 73-74 energy crisis, many building owners and operators reduced or even shut off outside air, securing immediate reductions in energy use, which of course what would happen, but also contributing once you seal all of your windows to the rise of sick building syndrome, such also happens in hotels and building related illness. And something happened also specifically in Philadelphia. Ventilation standards legionnaires crisis went back up but the experience raised the question of why it was necessary to route outside air circuitously through a building. Why do you have to have the HVAC system when there was adjacent air on the other side of the building envelope and you could just open all windows, which is of course now a recent question as we've just experienced it. Now, that question as she considers it, sick building syndrome, which we've already seen here is complicated enough evident at the time, but also after Hurricane Katrina, it's the easiest thing to blame the sickness that after these manufactured housing bits were supplied and people got very sick because of black mold and other air issues, one can blame the poor themselves who need the housing, the people who are displaced after a hurricane, uh, or the employees, which you can just say, well, they should just wear masks, never mind the fact that that same carbonic acid gas that we mentioned before is CO2 and the same carbonic acid everyone was afraid of at the time of the Spanish flu is just the carbon dioxide you exhale directly into your masks so that you can re-inhale it again. Now, that's the concern. She quotes, she cites Friedman Dyson, the characteristic feature of an ideologically driven technology is that it's not allowed to fail. And you can interpret that in lots and lots of ways. Now, we looked at yesterday, Illich on Deschooling Society. There were two short videos, one with the famous Pinky Strange School, Scary School Nightmare, which is worth looking at. That's very classic. And one connecting the issue of Deschooling Society with McIntyre. And the, and the University of Nietzsche and Snape because uh, that's rather, rather complicated question and they've all been interested in just that theme. Now there are two other essays you might have had a chance to take a look at, Loving on the Anatomy of Zoom Fatigue, along with on, online, Agamben's very brief, it's also part of Where Are We Now? It's also included in that same book, uh, Reflection uh, on what he called Requiem for the Students. I'm not gonna talk about those because we're living all of these reflections up close and personal for ourselves. So at this point, as we start unit four, remember that there are five units in the course, one that we're going on to technologies of consumption, destruction, takes us to waste water and the technology of deliberate pollution. So there we are right there, H2O and the waters of forgetfulness. The writing analysis is on this, just on this. That's all you need to be writing about. The extra readings, once again, just for future reference. And if you need, it's due on the 6th. It's not due on the 5th, but nothing is due on the 5th. You get that day off. But it's due on the 6th, but if you need to take to the 7th, which would be Wednesday, that's going to be fine. H2O and the waters of forgetfulness.